Hey, Kate, what did you eat last night? I had three dips. <laughs> three dips. Oh, my God. Three dips. Now, Rick, are you... I didn't you... know you'd gone to heaven. <laughs> I was about to say, now, Rick, are you fond of dip? <laughs> oh, Kate, I am fond of the dip. <laughs> Please tell me. I'm so excited. Did we ever talk on here about, like, the dip-tastic weekend? <laughs> I don't even remember. I... I don't think so. I don't so. think so either. Anyway, so I um, was having people over, and I just decided everything was dips. And so, because uh, it was supposed to be light food. And so I made muhamara, which is muhamara, which I think is um, <laughs> Middle Eastern. I don't know if it's, it, I don't know if it's India. I don't know, actually, it's, it's origin now that I think about it. It's a roasted red pepper and walnut dip. It sounds Middle Eastern, doesn't it? And it's yeah, got, it does. and pomegranate. So it has to be. It's Middle Eastern of some kind. And it's got pomegranate molasses in it, which is like a little bit tart as well nice. as sweet. Yeah. And so it's kind of sour. It's got a sourness to it. And it's also just really smoky and delicious. So I had that. And then, oh. yeah. And then the roasted butternut squash dip from Odalengi's book which know it well yes i know you're familiar with which has that beautiful date syrup drizzled on top of it and the black and white sesame seeds and cilantro so that's amazing it's funny if you just cook the butternut squash with cinnamon it's amazing what kind of flavor that that brings out i don't use Mm. those warm spices enough i don't think it's one of those things i need to learn more is using cinnamon in savory context like that because right. oh my gosh, you, there's nothing sweet in it. There's tahini and and garlic, and that's about it. And yogurt, and it's just amazing. Uh, and then a Moroccan carrot dip, which was oh. the healthiest of the bunch. It had almost no oil. It had like yeah, and it tasted the healthiest of the bunch, but it was still really tasty. <laughs> Thank God! Wow, those sound wonderful. What did you serve with them? Yeah, um, and I finally I will answer that in a second. I finally right. found a spiced Moroccan-y sort of curryish carrot dip that I like because I've been through a lot of recipes for those and um, they're not all very good. So this one involved cooking the carrots first in a way that I hadn't done before. Like you slice them and sort of steam them in a in a saute pan and then and you don't caramelize them. You don't you stop them right before they caramelize. But there's a huh. there's an element of cooking in there that that's um, with some spices that that does something to them. That's really great. Wow, nice. Um, the the usual suspects, I used pita, and I think I had rice crackers and um, some crudite. Were people appropriately appreciative? They were. They were. And it was a fun ranking of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly of like whose favorites were and it worked out really well because everybody had a different preference for number one two and three so it was a very well oh, nice. balanced group yeah yeah nice it was great so oh, that's great yeah it was fun how about you what'd you have i had an ishiyaki buri bop from iron chef morimoto's restaurant in waikiki kate what did you call me I called you a lot of names in that you one. You did. <laughs> Tell me. I had an, ish- an Ishiyaki Buri Bop. And this is from Iron Chef Morimoto's Restaurant in Waikiki when I was in Hawaii. I've been dying to tell you this for weeks, so I've been sitting on it because oh, I wanted to I'm save so it. so excited. For this. You know, because I love watching him. And he's obviously the fish master. Yeah. And, you know, I've struggled with fish. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to try it here. So basically, imagine this, if you will, Kate DeVore. Yes. A plank of wood, maybe about a quarter inch thick. On that comes this big ceramic pot. The pot's been heated to 450 degrees. Inside that pot is a mound of rice. And then sitting on top of that is four pieces of hamachi, which is Pacific yellowtail, which is raw. Okay. And then inside that is just a little um, fern yolk, egg. Then what they do is they come over, fern yolk, I think, or hen, fern hen, fern hen? Uh, I, I don't know, but it was an egg. It's a royal it fern. It says royal fern, royal fern egg yolk is what it okay. says. Okay, all right. So I think it's a hen. Must be, yeah. And so they come over, and then with their little, you know, chopsticks, they just basically flip the raw hamachi off the rice onto the side of the bowl, and it just starts to sear oh, right along the side of the bowl. Oh my gosh! Yeah, and then this rice mixture. They just start to mix. And then what's in the rice mixture is it's pickled daikon and carrot. And then it's got that little fern uh, egg yolk, which starts to fry. And then it's got a sweet ginger soy, a little bit of rice. And they call it this uh, yuzu uh, kotsu seasoning, which is a mm. Japanese seasoning. And yuzu is a citrus. Mm-hmm. It's a spite. It's a citrus. And it's mixed with chili peppers and salt. And then it's fermented. Mm. And so that all gets mixed. And it's cooking a little bit, right? Mm. And it's getting warm. 
And they're at my table for maybe, I'd say, a minute and a half mm-hmm. doing this. And then by the time they're mixing up that whole rice mixture and that egg yolk is cooked with a little bit of egg to go on the rice, they peel the yellowtail off the side of the bowl and it is perfectly cooked. Wow. Ooh, like just rare. Wow. And then what was also great is I ate the whole dish because of the heat of the bowl. It stayed hot the entire meal. Oh. It blew my mind. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And it's like this whole idea of like, wow, if I could eat that type of fish, which is super fresh and cooked that well, wow, I would be eating fish every day with no problems, unfortunately. <laughs> That's one of those times that I would um, ask for a bite of your fish. You know, oh, that dish totally. is one of those things that I would like to taste. Yeah. It's wow. just amazing that they just threw this fish on the side of the bowl and it just cooked perfectly by the time they're done mixing. What sweet organization and the service at the restaurant is really great, needless to say. Yeah, that sounds like a place with service. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Yeah. So wow, good. that sounds amazing. Hello and welcome to another episode of You Won't Believe What I Ate Last Night. I'm Rick. And I'm Kate. And this is our ongoing conversation about food, health, weight management, and our endeavor to be and stay healthy in a really tasty world. We love kindness and compassion towards ourselves and others. Well, here it is, part two of what we're cooking, what we've been preparing. We know you've been just on the edge of your seat waiting for part two, and here it is. It's finally here. You can hear more about what we've been into lately and what we're discovering and how we're cooking things. And as a reminder, let us know what you're doing. Let us know what you're cooking. Send us an email at you won't believe what I ate at gmail.com. Follow our social media, Facebook, Instagram. You won't believe what I ate last night. And as always, tell your friends about us when they're going on a long drive. Totally. People are always like, what good podcasts are you listening to? Please talk us up. Yeah. And I'm tired of everyone saying NPR, 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 NPR. <laughs> All That's right, what I then. listen to, NPR. <laughs> so don't say NPR to Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I made a cast iron skillet cookie, a chocolate chip cookie in the cast iron pan. What? Yeah. Tell me. Yeah, it was, um, it was pretty good. Oh, my gosh. I think I still have some in the freezer. I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's good. It, the pan, um, it, it gives it – the thing that was best about this recipe is that you brown the butter – in the pan first. So okay. it has brown butter in it, which makes it taste like there's toffee or something because it kind of caramelizes up the mm. edges on the bottom I and the that. sides. The part that's yeah. touching the pan has this wonderful toffee-like crispness. And then the center of the cookie is still really light and sort of, I don't know how to describe it, but soft, I guess. Mm. Um, it was it was tasty. Wow, nice. Mm-hmm. And it was how fun. How big of a skip? How big was your skillet? I used the full size one, the twelve inch <sighs> one that you have. Yeah, that's a big cookie, man. It was a big cookie. Well, it, indeed, it's a whole batch of cookies, but it's in one giant pan. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Nice. So it's fun presentation, also. You know, it looked cool. <laughs> it was really totally. easy to cut. It didn't stick or anything, so that was fun. Because I've been try- I spent so much effort trying to uh, season my pans, and I still I feel like my cast iron has a grudge against me. Every time I see it taunting me on these food shows, everybody pulls out their gorgeous pans and everything's perfect. And I have tried for years and it's one of those things that I just have a hard time with for some reason. And you just went through a whole reseasoning process with your cast iron pans. So what I'm labor saying, intensive. oh my God, it took a week. And again, the apartment reeked of oil because you had to keep putting oil in and put them in the oven over and over. It took days. I had to do like five <laughs> sessions in the oven. And it's still like the seasoning is still not sticking the way it's supposed to. It's, it's not good. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay, so speaking of smoke and flavors, so this other thing I've been doing, Kate, which I wanted to talk to you about, yes. is I've been making smoked Manhattans. Oh, I had <laughs> one in a bar, and it was amazing. <laughs> it really was. I was in a restaurant that, or it was a smoked Manhattan, which was basically like an ex, and a Manhattan, regular Manhattan, but they were going to smoke it, so I was interested to see how they were going to do it. So they basically brought this little piece of plank wood and on top of that i don't think it was plank i'm not sure what it was but on top of that they just had some chips some smoked chips wood chips lined up in a cute little pile wood chips 
and they brought a lighter, they brought a glass, and then they brought the Manhattan already mixed. So they basically had one of those lighters with the long leads where they basically light the wood chips on fire, and it took a bit, you know, to get them all lit. And then once they're on fire and smoking, they just held the glass over it for like 30, 40 seconds, and then immediately they pour the Manhattan into it, and right away you're sipping it. It was so good. So this is what I've been doing. I bought everything on Amazon. Isn't that lucky? <laughs> I have my little smoke chips here. I live in a little lighter. I make my little Manhattan. And then I get my glass and I hold it over. I've done it three times. And I'm getting better, I think, at getting the smoke chips to light, to get them to light quickly, and to really make sure I hold the glass over the smoke chips for a long enough time. Mm-hmm. And I, what I love about it is every time you drink the Manhattan, you just get a whiff of the mm. smoke up your nose because I don't particularly like drinking the smoky flavor mm. what's the thing is, what, is it mezcal is that the smoky mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. so I, I'm like a little bit of mezcal goes a long way for me but oh. I generally shy away now from drinks that have a lot of mezcal in it but I lo- smelling and also, it every time I drink it there's also some scotches that are really smoky like when I was making yes. the penicillins when you were here those are really yes. smoky also yeah and that's when they that's when they get it's, it's peaty, right? That's and also peaty, peaty, yeah. Yeah. Those are different. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I do love this flavor, but I always want it to be far more mild than I ever experience it. So I love this because it's not actually going down my esophagus. Yeah. <laughs> it's just going up my nose every time I drink. So it's really fun. I would love to try it. I know that the ones that I had were probably stronger than you would like then because they smoked the cherries. They didn't just smoke mm. the glass. And so there really was smoke through to the end and it was more intense. And I th- I yeah. like that smoky flavor. I will order drinks that are called like smoke on the water because I love <laughs> smoky things. Um, so I could see that this would be good. And I think I, I really should try it because I have some of those wood chips for my for my grill. Yes, totally. So I definitely can give it a go. Use them up. Yeah. My uh I also have a cocktail that I just have been into lately which is a white negroni. Nice. Yeah, so a regular negroni is gin, campari and sweet vermouth. And the white negroni is gin, white lilay and then something called cocchi americano which feels a little bit like lilay but it's got more bitterness to it. And both of those two are aperitifs that are wine based, so it's a little less boozy than a regular one because I think Campari has more alcohol mm-hmm. than the wine-based things. But um, they're they're infused with herbs and fruit and spices and Yum. things like that. And it is delicious and a little bit of bitters. So good. <sighs> and you've been making them at home, yeah? I've been making said? them at home. I'm pretty sure oh. I saw Jeffrey Zakarian make them on TV, <laughs> I bet. And I thought, I have to have that. And I love Lillet, and it's, it's not something I keep on hand because I drink it and it's, you know like wine but it's expensive um i had a white negroni once only recently like a couple months ago i don't recall it having the lillet in it but i remember liking it far better than the regular negronis well it's definitely less bitter it doesn't have that campari bitterness to it but the cocchi americano has some bitterness but less and i Mm. i wonder if it's one of those i mean even negronis it feels like people there's variations, right? But yeah, so yeah. I'm sure the white ones, there's even more variations because it's not probably not really a thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. I have been making my vegetable curry, which I'm really perfecting. Ooh, and nice. It's, Kate's it's, vegetable curry is really good. Oh, thank you. And this particular batch was so incredibly good. And I think it might be partly because, and I, it's hard because it's one of those things I make up all the time and I never write it down. And so I never know how much I'm doing. I do everything by eye. And so sometimes it's better than others. It's never terrible, but you know, sometimes it's really good. And this one was really good. And the only difference was in, in addition to the curry powder I use, and I am a strong proponent of Penzi's sweet curry powder. And sweet is misleading. It's not sweet. It's curry powder, but as opposed to their hot one. But they have mm. a million curry powders, and they're all delicious. I've tried most of them, and I gave you that box of them at one point. Yes, uh, yes. But their sweet curry powder is my favorite. But I added, in addition to that, a little bit of extra garam masala also. Nice. So it made it really deep. And I use coconut milk and canned tomato and chicken stock. I would have used vegetable stock if I was making it for vegetarian. It wouldn't have made much difference. And then it's it's the normal things, really. It's uh, onion... Ginger, garlic, serrano, um, ca- and I use cauliflower, sweet potato, red pepper, green beans, and peas in this one. Sometimes I add spinach, 
Mm. Sometimes I add other things. And I cook them in layers because they cook at different rates and I really want their textures to all be perfect. So I put them in at different times and then I let right. it simmer for a bit. And it was amazing. And then um, lime juice, yogurt, and cilantro. And if you like it, a mango chutney to go with nice. it. Nice. Absolutely nice. amazing. You know, m- curries is one of those things. The more I've made, they're so easy, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, once you get the hang of it, it's really something if you haven't invested the time to figure out. I put it off for so long. But once I started doing it, I'm like, gosh, they just really couldn't be simpler. Like figuring out your preferences is yeah, definitely takes a little time. But wow, it just cooks up quickly. Yeah. Oh, and also chickpeas because that's a protein. Because mm. I've put over the years, I've put chicken in, in this occasionally. And I don't prefer it. Like it, it definitely wants to be a vegetable dish in my Interesting. opinion. <laughs> the chicken always feels out of place. Any vegetables are fine in there, but the chicken, Mm. no. Well, less animals going into things, Mm -hmm. better off everyone is. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And then the last weird thing I've been into is uh, I made kombucha for the first time. Oh, God, kombucha. How did that go? Well, it just reminds me, I'm looking at my scobies, which I think are dying. I need to feed them sweet tea or something, I think. (laughs) No, what are scobies? Scobies are the weird discs of living bacteria that look like a jellyfish that you put into basically sweet tea like black tea or i guess you could use green tea with a lot of sugar in it and that sugar is what the scobies eat and it ferments and that's what makes kombucha and it supposedly has all kinds of wonderful gut health properties um and why did you make it Somebody gave me a kombucha making kit as a gift. My friend wow, Miriam gave right. it to me for my birthday. Nice. So I felt compelled to try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kombucha um, making kit people. So, yeah, exactly. And so I made six jars of it because that's what it made. And uh, three of them I made blueberry ginger and two of them, three of them I made uh, lime ginger. And they, when I first tested them, I'm like, huh, it sort of tastes like vaguely fruity sweet tea. It didn't have the kick that kombucha is supposed to have. It didn't feel particularly carbonated. And I followed the directions really well. And I always did the longest time for each of the things. And so, Mm. but I just tried them again the other day and they've been sitting in the fridge for a while. And so I opened two fresh bottles that hadn't been opened in there for a while. I wanted my mom to try them. And uh, they've gotten better actually in the fridge. They've gotten more intense and they taste a little more, more powerful. I don't know that I'll bother. I mean, I either need to give the scobies away or keep them alive and use them, one of the two, because they're they're valuable. Um, But I found the whole thing to be also kind of (laughs) yucky. The process process. was a little gross, yeah. And I find the scobies just creepy. Was it a lot of work? Um, A fair amount. You have to make this specific quantity of sweet tea in a particular way with the tea and the sugar and then you put the scobies in it and it has to sit in a particular kind of place for I can't remember how long a week or two I can't remember and then you have to strain it out and then you put it you decant it into smaller bottles that you put your flavorings in if you're going to use any and then those have to sit somewhere and ferment for a certain amount of time so it it was it it was fairly time consuming and so given how much I drink it which isn't that often I don't think it's, you know, it's expensive to buy. And if I drank it all the time, it would be worth it because I could make it for a lot cheaper than I could buy it for. But given that I really only buy it like once a month, I don't know that it's, right. I don't know that it's worth the trouble for me personally. Um, but I know a lot of people really swear by it in terms of gut health. People have said that it has solved their reflux issues. I've heard a lot of people say it helps with their irritable bowel syndrome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, apparently it can do some really great things. That might be, that's really sort of the, what seems like be like the biggest health benefit is it can help settle the whole digestive tract if you have any digestive issues. Yeah, I guess it resets your microbiome so that your yeah. gut bacteria is in balance. It's mm-hmm. got an awful lot of sugar in it. And I'm, I I'm interested in cutting down in sugar these days. So it's not, for me, it doesn't scream health because of all the sugar. So it depends yeah. on what you're using it for, I guess, like so many things. And like you, I will only do it rarely. It's not something I can do. Like I see, I see people in the yoga community drinking it daily or definitely several times a week, which I can't do. Yeah. I made a really great sausage and greens. Sausage and greens. Oh, right. You posted that picture of it. Yes. Kate. That looked really good. Oh, my gosh. So I usually do beans and greens, and I use a little bit of bacon as the flavor base for that. And I cook bacon and take it out of the pan and then put the other stuff in and cook it in the bacon fat. And I just use onions and garlic and red pepper flakes and greens and chicken stock, and then I finish it with vinegar. 
and put the bacon back in. Couldn't be simpler. Mm. And a can of cannellini white beans. So that's my normal beans and greens recipe, which is terrific. I love it. For some reason, I was seduced by the Italian sausage over at harvest time at my local store because they make their own and it, I've always wanted to buy it. And so I was walking by and it just like leapt into my cart. And so they just I had hate this when that happens. beautiful house made hot Italian sausage. So I thought, oh, I'm going to make that. And instead of beans, this will be the protein. And, and so anyway, so I did. And I, you know, cooked the sausages first and then cook the rest of the stuff and I used red pepper and onion and garlic and a little Aleppo pepper which is like a red pepper flake but it's slightly different flavoring and I used I usually use kale but in this case I used collard greens and mustard greens nice. which I which I cut up fairly small and then braised them in chicken stock and then oh. finished it with a little red wine vinegar and a little soy sauce, which was what surprised me. But I think I saw it in some recipe to, to add soy sauce. And I thought, huh. And I forget, soy is one of those things that a lot of people finish a dish with if it needs a little seasoning or something like that. I was just going to say, soy sauce, I feel like, is this new thing. It's like the new egg. You just put a dash of it on top of it, and it solves everything. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't use it. I usually use Worcester for that, but I think soy is a mm. little different. So um, it was... I thought I was going to put these sun-dried tomatoes in it and it was going to have a sort of Italian vibe but because it was Italian sausage, but it somehow didn't really. I don't know. It just had a unique flavor profile that I haven't really had before and it was so savory and delicious and it was really exceptionally good. And it's such a good combination of things. The flavors you described there, it definitely has like the, it has protein, it has vegetables, it definitely has the acid, mm -hmm. it has the fat, which is really great. Oh, yeah. Nice. So, Kate, I have been cooking with black lentils. Do you cook with black lentils a lot? No. Black no, lentils. I'm unfamiliar with black lentils. You know, and here's where I am on black lentils. I love black lentils. And I've gone through two big bags in like the last couple of months. And it just occurred to me that I'm sort of like done with the other lentils. I'm not saying I don't won't eat like the green lentils or the red lentils, but I'm done trying to cook them because they actually, I always cook them because I think I should, that they make me happy, that they're healthy. And obviously they are, but I'm not saying I particularly love them. Mm. But let me tell you, black lentils, I will cook so much more. And it's primarily because I think, you know, their flavor, their flavor profile is a little bit different. They're just heavier. Mm. They're a little heartier. They're meatier. They're earthier. And I just love them so much more. Are they just called black lentils? Do they have another name? Yeah, there's some kind. Of, what's the caviar? The famous caviar, beluga. There's some kind of times called beluga uh, lentils because really? they resemble beluga. Yeah, and then in, you know they're called black doll sometimes is how they're referred to. Hmm. You know, in Indian places. Yeah, Where they're do not you always get easy them? to find. I buy mine on Amazon. Hmm. And uh, I get these two big bags shipped. And the thing I like about them is they're super easy to cook. I actually think they cook a little bit easier. Oh, I'm not sorry. Not easier, but a little bit quicker mm. than the other lentils. And what I love about them is when I cook them, I never have any qualms about what I make. I just make them. Where when I get red, when I have red lentils or green lentils, I'm somehow always caught up about flavor profiles and what I put with which. But the thing about the black lentils is they're full of protein. From what I was reading, they're the highest the protein the, the lentil with the highest amount of protein. So I thought that was interesting. Hmm. And um, I've been using them a couple ways. So it's very easy to make a soup out of them, right? Just like you would any other lentil soup. So oh, I'm always yeah. starting with like a ghee, olive, a ghee, onion, and garlic. And then you put the lentils in. And then, you know, you put broth in and you make your soup. And you can throw in vegetables if you want. I like to throw in you know, carrots and I like to throw in mushrooms. And then really, I just think they receive flavor so well. So... I've done – so I do a soup. I'll tell you what I do first. So I do it in a soup form. And then the other thing I do is I just love to put in my little cast iron pan, I love to put a little ghee, onion, garlic, and then I um, will put the lentils in and I'll let them boil. And then about 10 minutes from the end, I'll throw in a bunch of kale and I throw in a bunch of curry. In a cast iron it. skillet? I'm surprised. Yeah. I just let them boil away. You don't do it in the Dutch oven. You do it in you the – can. But you, you do it in the just, actual cast iron skillet. Yeah, yeah. Because for huh. me, I'm making small. Because when I do it in the cast iron uh, or the Dutch oven, I tend to make a lot and I never need a lot. Mm. But the cast iron seems to work really well. And I just let them boil for like 20, 25 minutes in there. And at the end, I'll throw in kale, which I prefer. Or you can do spinach. And in that particular dish, I just throw in tons 
and tons of curry. And it's super simple. And it's done in like half an hour. And then um, the other thing that it takes really well is it the other flavors, I think the other it, um, spices that it takes really well is I've done cumin, cardamom, cinnamon. So um, any mixture of those will work really well. And then the other sort of combination I'll do is thyme and rosemary. Like those work really well. And then any of those flavor profiles I'll do within the um, – soup also that i talked about earlier and then the other thing i can do is once the soup you can puree the soup that comes out really well and it gets just really even richer i think and then uh i made this one thing it didn't come out very well but i tried to make a a lentil black lentil puree Mm. and so i cooked the beans and i had some onions in them and some garlic but i don't know what i did wrong but i just couldn't get it to be really smooth so i and i think it was just a dumb mistake like i don't think i had enough liquid in there yeah uh while i was doing it and i just got so frustrated by the end i just plopped it all on my plate plate and basically ate it yeah like yeah <laughs> you're like all right it tastes good this just isn't what i meant i had all these <laughs> these vegetables that i charred I'm like ooh, i'm gonna put all these charred vegetables right on top of the black lentil puree it's gonna be really awesome but it wasn't <laughs> i love that you tried that though Thank you. I love that you're like, ooh, that's going to be pretty. I'll smear it on the bottom of the plate, and then I'll put these veggies on top of it, right? Like, that's what you were thinking. You were going to make it look exactly. like, I love that. I love, because this was just for yourself, too, right? Yeah. See, I think, you know, I do that sometimes, too. I'll, like, actually care about presentation for myself occasionally. <laughs> Mostly I don't. Mostly I just bash it totally. on there. But every now and then I look at my plate, and I'm like, look how pretty. It looks like it would come from a restaurant. You're chefing. I, exactly. You were totally chefing. <laughs> So I have to confess, while I was talking to you, I looked up black lentils online or while you were talking because I'm (laughs) so intrigued and I'm super excited about this instant pot black doll recipe that came up. (laughs) So this is totally how the first thing I'm going to do with it. It looks like an unbelievably good recipe. So I'm super excited. What do they say to do? And the thing that... um, so this is a teaser, y'all. You uh, are going to find out. We have a whole episode coming up for you on Instant Pot. Um, but this is an example of, yes, you could probably make it in almost the same amount of time in on the stovetop. But I bet you that with all of these spices in there, the flavor is going to be more intense in an Instant mm-hmm. Pot. It's got garlic, star anise, coriander, cumin, cayenne, fennel, garam masala, cardamom, butter, oil, onion, ginger, garlic, bay leaf, cinnamon stick, lentils, tomato paste, and water. And then you're supposed to finish it with um, butter and, if you want, heavy cream, cilantro, and yogurt. So even though that's a lot, I have most of those things, you know. I don't have any star anise. That's the only one of those spices that I would have to go buy. But pretty much I have the rest of those things sitting around. So... Uh, it's amazing. And you toast the spices first mm-hmm. and then grind them. And then you do saute the onion a little bit in the Instant Pot first and then add the ginger and garlic. And then you stir other things in and uh, you then you just put everything else in. So there is a nice. little sauteing and then you finish it with the butter and stuff. So it's pretty easy. Um, but it's true that it it uh, you could totally do it on the stovetop, but I bet it would be good. Mm. <laughs> you know, and you and I have I talked about this before. You know, this idea of Popeye food. Yeah. That once you eat it, mm, it just transforms your body. And I don't feel that with red lentils or green lentils, but I do feel it with the black lentils. And I sit there, I'm like, I could eat these lentils all day long, which I don't always feel with other lentils. And the other thing black lentil takes really well is coconut. I have some uh, so that you can put coconut mi- coconut cream in, coconut milk in. And you can mix that into your soup. You can mix that into just a dash into however you prepare it. So I love that. And then I also have sort of raw coconut that I'll just shred and put right on the top of it. So it takes coconut really, really well. Mm. And I think what you said is true. I feel like this is a dish I always have something in my cupboard that I can throw in with the spices, mm-hmm. even if I have nothing else. So it's always a dish that's available to make within a half an hour. Even if I don't have the spinach or kale, I'll still eat like the lentils. Yes, the I get it. And it see, it would keep well in the fridge if you made yeah. extra. It would be it good for a couple well days too. and yeah. it would freeze well. And this recipe just calls for oil at one point. It doesn't specify what kind. So I would probably use coconut oil 
because mm-hmm. of what you just said, because it goes well with those flavors as well. Yeah. I do. Uh, yeah, the Popeye food we, we've talked about before. It's um, the first time I, I think Star, I think my friend Star coined that term when I used to make this spinach and chickpea pasta. And there was something about the combination of those that just felt really nourishing and strengthening. And so mm. we call those things Popeye foods, things that you just feel like your body is like, yes, this is so good for me. And uh, for me, it's lentils and quinoa together. There's something mm. about the combination of lentils and quinoa together that always feels like popular right. food. Um, I agree that plain lentils less so, but maybe these ones, because they have more protein, maybe it would for me too. I'm very excited about this, Rick. Thank you. Oh, fun. Because I didn't really think about the protein thing, but when I really was prepping this episode and what to talk about, I thought, why do I love them? So I, re- I actually went on the old internet and thought, what is it about them that's making them work for me? Well, and the first thing that came up right now when I typed in black lentils was an article from, I think it was Bon Appetit, that said, black lentils are far and away the best lentils to use for cooking. (laughs) So you you are uh, on par with Bon Appetit, sir. I am the the cutting edge. (laughs) You absolutely are. (laughs) How exciting. All right. Well, thank you. Well, we hope this has inspired you to really... Think about what you're cooking lately and really cook things that you're passionate about and you enjoy cooking and make you feel good because it's probably, correct me if I'm wrong here, Kate, going to let lead to a greater sense of well-being and happiness. <laughs> I will not argue with that. 